What does the birth of the great state of Alabama, one of the finest examples of colonial federal architecture, doctors, generals, the northern aggression, one of America's premier artists and an Alabama poet laureate all have in common? The tapestry of the story is about to unfold as we focus on some of Alabama's greatest treasures. Welcome to Southern Heirlooms. I'm Ken Rivenbark. Welcome to Southern Heirlooms with Ken Rivenbark. The answer to all your car buying questions. Now in the hands of every salesperson at your North Alabama Honda dealer. Saving you lots of time. Folks love the Accord. How many to choose from? 48 today. Pick your favorite color and trim level. Best price? $1.99 a month. Compare it to a Camry. Take a look. Gas mileage? Up to 36 miles per gallon. That's one giant leap in car sales technology. And it's only at your North Alabama Honda dealer, Huntsville, Decatur, and Florence. Hi, I'm Tommy Battle, mayor of the city of Huntsville. I want to welcome you to the Whedon House. The Whedon House was built in 1819. Same time Alabama became a state. And the Whedon House is one of the oldest home museums in the state of Alabama. Come visit the Whedon House. It's one of our five museums in Huntsville. Come and stay and enjoy your stay here. Today we are revisiting part of Alabama's rich historical heritage as seen through the windows of one home, the Whedon House in Huntsville, Alabama. The Whedon House is a superb example of federal architecture. This style of American architecture was generally popular during the period of 1776 through 1835 and was greatly influenced by the light and elegant designs created by English architect Robert Adams. In many of writings about the Whedon House, the home is described as Adamesque after Mr. Adams. The house at 300 Gates Avenue, originally named the Aspen House, was built in 1819 by Henry Bradford, who desired for his residence an impressive townhome in the federal design. It was an ambitious architectural feat for Huntsville for two reasons. The home was built intact, meaning the house was built at one time. Most federal homes of the period were constructed with one main room per level with a kitchen attached and then later added to. The other reason was the refinement and use of woodwork. No other surviving federal period Huntsville House has woodwork as elaborate as that of the Whedon House. To place this on Alabama's historical timeline, it was in 1811 that Huntsville became the first incorporated town in Alabama. However, the recognized birth year of the city was 1805, the year of John Hunt's arrival. When we return, we're going to take you into the doors of the Whedon House Museum. We'll be right back. To say you've worked too hard to let this economy jeopardize your future would be an understatement. While you don't have control over today's markets, you do have control over how well prepared you are for the future. That's where the Keen Group at UBS Financial Services Incorporated in Huntsville can help. Wealth Management Advisors Penny and Tom Keen will create a plan that can help you weather the uncertain markets while keeping you on track. Call or visit our website, The King Group, at UBS Financial Services Incorporated in Huntsville. Member FINRA SIPC. After 20 years, Artistic Images Gallery has now moved to the corner of Bob Wallace and LNN next to r, &R Antiques and Salon Katera. We still offer the expert framing and art gallery you've come to expect, Artistic Images Gallery. There are several architectural characteristics of the Whedon House that set it aside as one of the finest examples of federal architecture in Alabama. I want to start with this mantle. This mantle is original to the home, built in 1819. It is hand carved. It, let me start with this fan shape uh, motif in the middle. It's a fan shape with a pine cone. One of the other attributes I think is incredible is the serpentine top. All of these little circles are hand carved, just incredible. And then down on the sides are double reeded colonnettes, and these mimic the columns, uh, the colonnettes at the front door. 
Notable exterior architectural features include the roof cornice, the frise below the front roof eaves, and the brackets or corbels underneath the cornice that support it. All are based on the classical Corinthian order. The frise features a leaf pattern cast lead design topped by a band of small vertical wooded, wooden flutes. Each of these hundreds of flutes is a separate hand carved piece. The underside of the box cornice is decorated with a series of hand carved woodblock corbels or in the Corinthian terminology, medallions. One of the most visual characteristics that, that people often associate with the Whedon House is this beautiful semicircle leaded glass fan light. The leaded glass side light panels are replaced but were originally leaded in semicircle patterns as they appear today. Inside the architecturally perfect cantilevered circular staircase winds up to the second floor and the interior woodwork is the most elaborate in Madison County. By cantilevered, I mean the staircase appears to be floating. In reality, it's held together by six cast iron uh, supports. Uh, these appear to be banisters, um, but they actually hold the staircase uh, in place. The treads are different sizes as the curve of the staircase begins, and the hand-carved woodwork follows suit, so you'll see there's different sizes. And one last interesting characteristic I want to share with you is the ivory medallion in the newel post. When the owner would pay off the mortgage, they would burn the mortgage, put the ashes in the newel post, and plug it with the ivory medallion. When visitors uh, would come into the home, they would see this and they know the house is paid for. The Flemish bond laid brick appear on the two street sides of the house. This method of brick laying alternated bricks turned in ways into the 18 inch thick walls. This method created a beautiful pattern but was extremely expensive in 1819. The brick exterior was not painted until the mid 19th century. The wood elements of the Whedon House are joined by peg mortise and tenon connections, meaning one piece of wood was trimmed to slip into another, then held together by a peg called a tree nail. The window sashes, blinds, mantles, and doors have visible peg corners. The machine for making concealed tenons was not invented until the late 19th century. Pine flooring in the entryway is laid tightly with narrow strips less than three inches wide. Flooring of five to six inch wide strips with open joints were the norm for the federal period and is utilized throughout the rest of the Whedon House. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Brooks and Collier welcomes you to their end of season savings on outdoor furniture. Thanks guys, but you and I know full well that with the cooler weather, the season's just begun. Lottie and I think alike. Outdoor fashions, big green eggs, green fun. Brooks and Collier. Rivenbark and Roper Antiques began serving customers June 2006 and is regarded as Huntsville's finest antique gallery. The shop represents high quality antiques from the 18th to the early 20th centuries, the largest collection of silver in North Alabama, Chinese and Japanese export porcelains, and original art from around the world. From day one, the business has focused on three principles that have established the essence of Rivenbark and Roper Antiques. They take great pride in providing their clients with the highest quality merchandise at the lowest prices possible, offering hospitality and personal service to build a relationship of trust and to celebrate with customers the joy of bringing beauty, style, and elegance to their homes. Rivenbark and Roper Antiques has gained the reputation of offering a high quality product with extensive personal service. The shop has lived by the strict policy of not selling reproduction furniture and abiding by the original guidelines of not selling furniture newer than 1940. Their strengths are reflected in their dedicated customers. Customers know that when they engage in business with Rivenbark and Roper, they can count on truth, knowledgeable information, and customer dedication.
Welcome back to Southern Heirlooms. I'm Ken Rivenbart. On today's show, we're talking about the Whedon House Museum and the incredible life of Maria Howard Whedon. Joining me is Gay Bunny. Gay has worked diligently for years, helping to secure the legacy and the structure of the Whedon House. She also chairs the Whedon House Committee. Gay, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Ken, for having me. I'm so excited that you're able to join me today, and we want to have a conversation on um, the life of, of Howard Whedon. We're going to be showing some of her, her works later. Um, let's just start talking about how the Whedon family came to Huntsville. Well, Dr. Whedon moved his family to Huntsville, <clears throat> and they, uh, they lived on what we call Redstone Arsenal today. And Whedon Mountain on the Arsenal was named for the family. In 1845, he bought the house in town mainly because he wanted his children to have a great education. And at that time, there were many, many good schools, mm -hmm. seminaries, private schools in Huntsville for his children to, to uh, be educated. Okay, and shortly after, only one year after he had purchased the Aspen House, which later we know as the Whedon House, he was on a trip to New Orleans to sell his cotton crop, and tragedy struck and, and he passed away. Right. Six months later, Maria Howard Wien was born. Yes. So let's take it there and talk about um, what type of life do you think they had um, prior to the Civil War? Well, I think that he left his family uh, uh, well cared for, cared for mm -hmm. because he, he was a rich man at that time. Mm -hmm. And so they had no worries as far as, um, you know, making, a, they had their money to live on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Things changed. Okay, and then here comes the Northern aggression, the right. Civil War. Now, uh, Howard uh, graduated from the female seminary. Here in Huntsville. Right, and she was, uh, she loved art and she loved music and was good at both. Mm -hmm. But of course, art was her main uh, talent. And, and if I'm understanding correctly, because of her love of art and, and what she, sh her talent that she showed, her mother hired, um, a Huntsville artist, William Fry, yes. and to give her private lessons, and that helped um, escalate her talents even further. That's correct. Okay, things changed. Yes, indeed. Okay, let's talk about it. Well, of course, the, uh, the Civil War began, and uh, when the troops came in, they confiscated the Wheaton House. This was 1862. Right, as well as some of the other uh, historical homes in Huntsville. Mm -hmm for their offices to live in. Mm -hmm. And the family, uh, for a few days, or maybe longer than that, lived in the stables. Yes, they, the, 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 they had taken the, over the Whedon House and the, um, the officers lived there. Yes. And they, they liked the Whedon House because it was a large stable in the back for the horses. And they made um, Maria Howard Whedon, her sister Jane, and her mother move into the, one of the servants' quarters with the servants. Right. And then uh, they decided in the, in, the, uh, in the middle of the night mm -hmm. to get their horses and their buggy and go to Tuskegee, where uh, the older sister lived until the end of the war. Okay. And then after the war is over, it's safe to come home, they come home and find that the Whedon House has been plundered, um, their finances are gone, and life starts to change. Absolutely. Maria Howard Whedon, she was as Howard as she liked to be called, began taking on odd jobs to help meet the um, personal finances for the family. Let's talk about that. Well, she did um, place cards for dinner parties. For neighbors or, uh, or whomever. And she did uh, with, you know, maybe wildflowers out of her mother's garden. Uh, she did uh, invitations to parties, get well cards, all types of things of that nature. And she also started teaching art classes for children yes. to help make uh, um, means um, for the family. Let's talk about her now. Uh, one, there was a poem that um, she had taken that someone else had written, and she rewrote it in a, in a black dialect and illustrated it into a little book and she had painted some of the pictures of her, her servants um, yes. that worked with them 
and um, this is what sort of catapulted her career. She, uh, other people saw it and, and were really crazy about it. And so look what happens next? Well, you know, uh, when they were in Tuskegee uh, and the family that they became close to, Elizabeth Price, mm -hmm. was uh, her mentor. Um, and she took a lot of these paintings and she promoted Howard mm -hmm. as well. But she would sit and paint, and uh, when she would paint some of the servants of some of the neighbors, she would talk to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, then she would compose a poem from what their discussion had been, which I think was just great. Yes. Some in dialect, some not in dialect. What I love about Howard Weed, and we'll see when we show some examples of her, her um, work a little bit later, her focus was to capture the spirit and soul of the individual. And, and I think she's done that so incredibly well. She was the first American artist to paint the servants are black Americans in this manner. Her counterpart of these years was Joel Chandler Harris. And, and his uh, illustrations were more um, characters. Um, so this was the first American artist who really created beautiful images of these individuals and she wanted them immortalized yes and uh, that's fascinating and you know he came down to Huntsville to meet her in fact he said I'm going to Huntsville to meet Mr. Whedon mm -hmm. so uh, many people thought of her as a man because her going by Howard Whedon mm -hmm. and you know she also wrote uh, articles for uh, the Presbyterian Church in their the, newsletter the Chronicle the Chronicle yes. and she went by Flake White which is a oil paint color, the name of an oil paint color, flake oh, that's white. that's fascinating. So that's interesting too. Very much so. And, and, and in, in these writings, she wrote much about her moralistic views. And, and again, I think the spirit of Howard Whedon comes through in these writings. She wrote what was passionate to her. And although uh, she was frail and sickly all of her life, when it came to her art and her writing, she was a powerful force. She knew what she was doing. She knew what, you know, the, what she wanted to express with her pen and with her brush. And you know what's amazing to me is that she had a brush with just three hairs. And she painted all those beautiful watercolors with a brush like that. That is amazing. And she suffered from severe nearsightedness. Yes. So she was working very, very up close. Yes. Um, so it is amazing. As we close here, what is the most important thing about Howard Whedon that resonates with you? Well, I think uh, at the time, during those times, a woman of small stature, uh, frail, and poor eyesight could do such wonderful paintings. And uh, she was brave. I mean, you know, taking care of her family that way. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just think she was wonderful. I, I agree, totally. And in closing, I would like to just build on what you just said. Howard Whedon could have easily said, you know, I suffer from this, I suffer from that, we've been through hardships. She faced adversity face on, and she supported her people, she took care of her people, and also with the servants. She also, in many of her writings, she talked about how they took care of her, she took care of them, they were part of her family. They didn't just work for her, they, they were part of her family. And, and she turned this into a really positive situation and we today are better for it. You know, I'm just sorry that she didn't write more books. Yes. With just the four. She, we could have just had more and more and more art and poetry, but unfortunately that did not happen. When we return, we're going to be talking about the four books that Howard Whedon wrote, looking at examples of her art, and delving into the individuals that she painted. Stay tuned. You're watching Southern Heirlooms. Established in 1978, Randy Roper Interiors is the premier interior design firm for residential and commercial projects. The goal at Randy Roper Interiors is to work with each client to create a beautiful, warm, and comfortable space that reflects your individual tastes. 
Randy Roper Interiors offers one of the largest resource design libraries in Alabama and is located at 311 North Jefferson Street in downtown Huntsville. Randy Roper Interiors, where experience matters. Richard's Lighting has been proudly serving the people of Huntsville and the Tennessee Valley since 1963. Our showroom is home to the largest display of residential lighting in the state of Alabama and features items from over 100 of the finest manufacturers from around the world. Whatever your style, crystal or contemporary, wrought iron or rustic, traditional or transitional, Richard's Lighting can help your home come alive. Whether looking for the one perfect fixture or lighting your entire home, the highly experienced staff at Richard's is here to serve you. Richard's Lighting, come imagine the possibilities. Welcome back to Southern Heirlooms. I'm Ken Rivenbart. I want to begin the, this segment focusing on the four books that Howard Whedon wrote. She published the four books uh, during the period 1898 to 1904, and it was also during this time she was named Alabama's Poet Laureate. Now, I have a, a gallery here of incredible images in the likeness of Howard Whedon. I commissioned a, a, an artist out of New York to um, do interpretive works of, of some of her subjects. Maria Howard Whedon painted in watercolors and most of her portraits were five by seven in size. These paintings are oil on canvas and they're the size of 16 by 20. What I really wanted to focus on is when in Howard Whedon's writings, she wrote that she wanted to capture the spirit and soul of the individual. She wanted the individual immortalized. And through research and her letters and books, we've been able to identify some of these characters. And I want to introduce you to the individual so it's no longer just a painting, but it's an individual. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to some of these incredible people. Let's start at the top. This is Uncle Champ, and she used Uncle Champ in several different paintings. As she went, did with, with a lot of her paintings, she would use an individual. She would uh, change around their face a little bit, their, their body structure. But Old Champ was the personal valet of Governor Patton. And Governor Patton was uh, Governor of Alabama 1865 to 1867. What is so important about Governor Patton is that even though he was in office only two years, he really supported indigenous people and people who were struggling financially. He created uh, the patent certificates that helped people, um, it, they were like, it was like money. So he, he gave it to uh, the, the people in need to help with their daily lifestyle. The next person I'd like to introduce you to is Francis Bell. Frances Bell's character was used in many of Howard Whedon's mammies. Again, ver younger, older versions were created. Frances Bell worked for the Clay family, relatives of Governor Cumber Clay, and she lived next door to Howard Whedon. Frances Bell would never pose for Howard Whedon. So what Howard did was in her upstairs bedroom, she would watch through the picket fence next door as Frances Bell took care of the children. And, and she wrote about how picturesque she was um, against a large oak tree um, in her motherly way caring for these children. Frances Bell and Howard Reed Whedon referred to Frances as Aunt Frances. Next, I'd like to move up to a painting here and introduce you to John Ruckert. John Rucker was a shoeshine boy in downtown Huntsville. He liked to sing and dance as he would shine shoes. One of the business owners named Joe E. Cooper was having a shoe shine one day and he was engaging uh, young John in conversation and he was delighted at his dancing and singing. He asked John, where do you live? John simply replied, oh, here and there. Upon further um, questioning, Joe Cooper said simply, do you have a home to go to each night? Young John replied, no, I don't. So he invited him to come home and live with he and his wife. They had a quarters out back and, and set up a room for John and he lived with them for a couple years. Later on, um, the Al Fields Minstrel Show came to town. 
and because Joe was so um, interested in his talent, he wanted to introduce Joe to Al Fields. So he took it to him, took Joe to him and said, you know, I'd like for you to meet this young man. I'd like for you to audition. I think he'd be a great uh, contributor to your show. Al Fields hired him. John Rucker became famous in the minstrel world. So his legend uh, went way beyond Shoeshine Boy. I'd like to introduce you to one last character, St. Bartley Harris. St. Bartley Harris uh, was probably one of Howard Whedon's most famous portraits. He was the pastor of the Negro Primitive Baptist Church, and records indicate that he baptized more than 3,000 people in Big Spring Lake. His legend lives on today as the Primitive Baptist Church is now named St. Bartley Primitive Baptist Church. It's located on Belafonte Avenue in Huntsville, Alabama. Stay tuned. Salon Katera is the place where style meets care and individual attention. At Salon Katera, we know that people may forget what you said, may forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Salon Katera, a natural formation of complete beauty. Come visit the Little Green Store on Montesano Mountain. The Little Green Store carries art, ceramics, jewelry, and gift items representing the work of over 100 artists and artisans. Every piece is American-made, and most of the art showcases the creative pulse and energy of Huntsville and North Alabama. Engage with your community and give local artists a voice when you purchase local, high-quality, and environmentally friendly art and design. The friendly staff at the Little Green Store is eager to assist you in finding special and unique gifts for every occasion. The Little Green Store on Montesano Mountain. In 1893, Howard Whedon had a small exhibit at the Chicago's World Fair. While there, she visited the exhibits of other artists, and two in particular portrayed African Americans. These were portrayed, though, in a comical, minstrel way, and for better words, making fun of them as individuals. This highly offended Maria Howard Whedon. She came back to Huntsville full of energy and she said, this is not what our people look like. I want to portray them as they really are. Today, we are so thankful to Howard Whedon for give, providing us that legacy. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, we know and can see the spirit of these individuals and their images live on in history forever. With a heart full of gratitude, I'm Ken Rivenbart. <laughs>